So I'm Henry Brady. Here we are in the living room of the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. And today we're going to talk with Professor Elizabeth Linos, who is a uh, member of the faculty of the Goldman School and who works on public management. Professor Linos, you work in the management area. Um, tell us about what is important for public management these days? Why do we think this is such an important initiative in the Goldman School to actually get better at this? Yeah, so I think there are uh, a lot of really smart people thinking about public policy more broadly. They're mm -hmm. thinking about how we can design policies well, um, and then there's a whole other group of people who are thinking about how to evaluate those policies to make sure they're working for people. Um, but I think um, one thing that has kind of uh, been forgotten or hasn't uh, mm -hmm. received enough attention is how to actually implement those policies. Mm -hmm. um, to think through uh, both the people that are called to implement every change that a government uh, launches, uh, but also how they affect kind of the day-to-day -day operations of this uh, huge thing we call mm -hmm. the government. Um, so public management scholars like myself are really focused on kind of the day-to-day nitty-gritty of, of getting government done and thinking about how to uh, make sure that it works forever. So do we sometimes come up with better policies than uh, than implementation of those policies? And do we sort of fail because we, we just simply don't implement them very well? I think so. I think um, uh, there have been uh, many instances, uh, especially in the US government, but also globally, where a really good idea fails because it wasn't implemented well, because we didn't give the same sort of attention to the implementation. Give me an example or two. I guess I could say healthcare.gov okay. uh, as kind of the obvious recent example, <laughs> yeah. but it's not the only one. So this is the website that was put up and it was a lot of fanfare and then it just sort of uh, didn't work very well. Yeah, and I think part of, it's a good example because there was so much emphasis um, and necessary emphasis on the politics mm -hmm. of getting health insurance for people, um, figuring out how to make this a legal policy. But really, we should have given the same, number, the same amount of attention to um, how to actually implement it. Mm -hmm. uh, because people's experience uh, when they interact with government is affected by that implementation rather than the law. And so they think that's the policy when in fact it's just the implementation exactly. of the policy. And I don't even mean to say just the, yeah. in fact it's an essential part of it. What's another example of where we may have not done so well? Well, uh, well, I used to work in, in Greece, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Greece was going through a very difficult uh, financial crisis. But you were in the prime minister's office, right? I was in the prime minister's office. Um, and we were called to make major reforms uh, through an IMF package to how Greece International functioned. International monetary fund. Yes. Uh, which often tells countries that are experiencing difficulties they have to do certain things in order to get international loans. Exactly. Um, and this is something that many countries uh, across the globe have faced at different points in their history. Um, and the, the push to, to make these reforms happens when you're already in crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're urgent. So there is a lot of uh, emphasis and a lot of negotiations and a lot of um, international agreements uh, about the specifics of the policy. But I found that uh, sometimes, even once you've agreed on the policy, how you actually get your entire civil service mm -hmm. to accept those changes and implement them quickly when they, they don't have time to be trained, they don't have um, time to, to provide their input, um, that ends up being where, where things fail. Give me an example of one thing you, that really needed to be done, at least according to the IMF in Greece, and that you just had tremendous difficulty implementing? Uh, tax reform. Okay. So one of the main challenges in Greece has been uh, how to think about uh, tax fraud, uh, how to think about uh, collecting taxes better in general. So um, there's a tremendous amount of tax fraud. A lot of people don't pay their taxes at all. Uh, well, is yes, that right, that's, I think that's the general narrative. How true that is depends uh, on, on data that we didn't necessarily have at the time. Um, but there's certainly enough of a problem that we had to think about tax reform. Mm -hmm. um, and there's certainly uh, a group of uh, wealthy individuals that weren't paying their taxes. Uh -huh. oh, which, which is, yes. Which is uh, From common. From a symbolic perspective, yeah. problematic and, and makes uh, obviously a lot of people upset. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so there was um, you know, a, big, a big push to change how we do uh, both tax collections and tax inspections. But that requires um, various levels of public management change. So how do you hire different tax collectors? When do you train them? How mm -hmm. do you incentivize them? How do you change their performance metrics? All those are typical public management mm -hmm. um, questions that we didn't really have the time to think through 
uh, because the whole world was watching and just mm -hmm. wanted tax reform today. So when you teach management to uh, the Goldman School students, uh, you try to tell them better ways to do this. And what are the tools you, you, that you use in your research and in your teaching to try to explain how to do this better? Yeah, so uh, I mean, there are many tools that are available. Uh, the tools that I generally use for my research and what I teach to the Goldman um, School students uh, is really thinking about data and evidence in a new way. So uh, we've all been trained to think about data and evidence for policy making. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I argue is that we should be using that same level of rigor um, when we think about public management questions. So that means, you know, if you are a public manager, or if you're, or if you're training to become a public manager, as many of our students are, you have to be thinking both about um, metrics and data, how you're going to collect that data, mm -hmm. how you're going to use the administrative data that's already being collected in government, um, and how you're going to evaluate what works. Um, as you think about innovation in government, as you think about changes. So give me some examples of things that you yourself are doing to try to um, gather evidence and come up with better ways to make government work. Sure. So a lot of, uh, of my research focuses on how to improve government by, by focusing on its people. Uh, so there's two strands to that. One strand is how do you uh, recruit uh, and retain good people in government? And the other strand is um, how do you uh, support the staff that you already have so that they can perform well and, and, and stay happy in their jobs. And motivate them to do their jobs. And motivate yeah. them to do yeah. their jobs. Um, on the recruitment side, we've done quite a bit of work on uh, trying to diversify uh, the type of person who is interested in a job in government. Um, and specifically, I've been working in law enforcement, so working with so a lot of... So why does that matter in law enforcement? Why, why is diversity important in law enforcement? Well, I would argue diversity is important everywhere. Okay. Um, and there is some evidence, uh, although we need more of it, that uh, if you have a more diverse team, you have better outcomes. If you have a more diverse public mm -hmm. service, um, you actually deliver better services. Um, in law enforcement, it's just become a lot more urgent uh, over the past few years mm -hmm. uh, because the relationship between communities and their police departments have been uh, fraught. Uh, and, you know, in the U.S., 75% of police officers are still white. So they clearly don't represent the communities that they're serving. Uh, so it's become kind of an urgent uh, struggle that a lot of police departments are facing. A lot of chiefs um, want to, to see changed. Uh, but the basic question is, how do you get new and different people to apply um, to the police, given the political climate? Mm -hmm. um, what I've been doing is thinking about um, different reasons why someone might join mm -hmm. uh, a police department or government in general and using kind of what we know about human mm -hmm. motivation and human psychology to test uh, new approaches to recruitment. Mm -hmm. So what might be some of those reasons and how do you test for which ones really work? Sure. Um, I can give you an example. Um, in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, we were working with uh, Chief Fletcher there. Uh, he wanted to diversify his police force, and we had an opportunity to essentially send out new job advertisements to um, anyone in the community. Now, the typical kind of recruitment message in police departments and in government has really focused on public service motivation. Mm -hmm. So you'll see things like, come serve the community, mm -hmm. come protect the community. What we wanted to do is, is try uh, alternative motivations. So we said, you know, actually being a police officer is really hard. Why don't we tell people, you know, this is really challenging. If you're the kind of person who um, thrives in a challenging environment, uh, you're just the kind of person we're looking for. So or this you might is the, be, the Marines approach. The Marines so approach. So you want to be a Marine. You know, it's you know, tough. It's tough. Yeah. Or you might want to focus on kind of the career prospects or the job security. That's a mm -hmm. t totally legitimate reason to join the police force. What we did is we tested these in a field experiment, which means um, we essentially uh, sent postcards to people, but we randomly selected who got which message. And this is the gold standard of evaluation. And we wanted to test which version of this postcard or this job advertisement would um, cause more people to apply. Well, it turns out the public service message was no different than not sending a message at all. Really? Um, it was no different than the control group. Mm. But the challenge message um, and the career message more than tripled the likelihood mm. that someone would apply to the police. And for people of color, uh, the effect was even larger. So for people of color, it was four times um, wow. as likely. Um, and that's just a proof of concept. So that's pretty astonishing. I mean, yeah, that's very, it's a big and were effect. you surprised by the results? Uh, well, I was encouraged by the results. That's okay. Uh, they're in line with um, research and behavioral science. Mm -hmm. And now, um, 
you know, other police forces across the country are excited about the idea of testing. I think the main message that we can take from these um, projects is not that the challenge message is always going to work, for example, um, but that we should be testing these things mm -hmm. in a rigorous way um, and seeing what works in, in each case. So part of what you use is what's called behavioral economics or behavioral insights. Explain what that means in general. So the premise of behavioral science or behavioral insights is that we should be designing policies and programs based on how people actually behave versus um, how we think they should behave in kind of a rational uh, actor model. Okay. Um, now, it doesn't mean that people are irrational. They're, they're um, making decisions that make sense uh, based on you know, years and years of evolution. Uh, and, and they're systematic and they're predictable. So we should be incorporating those um, insights from human psychology into how we design economic policy. So that's kind of what behavioral so, science is so about. So what are the big things that behavioral insights have come up with that are sort of contrary to the standard economic model? Standard economic model would just sort of say, well, people uh, come and work if they're paid more and right. if working conditions are better, and that's pretty much the whole ball of wax. And yeah. you're saying, no, it's more complicated than that. So it's certainly more complicated than that uh, in ways that are predictable. So anytime we think, um, you know, this should just be a simple cost-benefit calculation, mm -hmm. we also need to think about um, people's time, people's uh, mental workload, um, all the other things that are happening in their lives. And you'll see in, in kind of very predictable ways, if you make something much easier for people to understand, if you bring forward the benefits, mm -hmm. um, it's much easier for people to take action. Uh, as opposed to kind of do those uh, daily calculations on every one of their decisions. So really, the, the, you know, the big successes of behavioral science have come from things that should be intuitive, making things really simple, uh, bringing forward the benefits uh, or explaining the costs in a different way, um, thinking about motivations outside of just uh, you know, rational actor calculation. We care about our families. We care about how other people view us. Uh, we care about, um, you know, not risking too much when we're making a decision. Mm -hmm. And those things play out in all sorts of different policies. So there's other areas you're working in. I know you're working in burnout, for mm -hmm. example. So tell us about burnout. Well, sure. What's the problem there, and how can we help to solve it? Sure. So um, recently, I've been working a lot on burnout because I'm interested in this idea of you know how do we motivate staff. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that there are frontline workers across the country that are working really hard under very difficult circumstances, are almost um, you know, traumatized by their work on a daily basis. But they're and this not. is police officers, but it's also welfare workers yep. or uh, foster care people or child welfare workers and so forth and so forth. Yeah, so uh, if you think about uh, all the frontline workers that are uh, basically propping up our entire system of taking care of each other, whether it's police officers, correctional officers, 911 call takers and dispatchers, social workers, um, they're making decisions on a daily basis that affect uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people, uh, often very vulnerable members of our communities, but they're traumatized by their work and by their decisions and are not getting the... the so be explicit about it. They're traumatized because they think they've made a mistake, for example. So you get a 911 call, yeah. And somehow you feel like you haven't handled that properly. Not necessarily that you haven't handled that properly. Just um, if you think about it, when when uh, someone calls nine one one, they're they're going through a difficult circumstance. They're traumatized by that one event. The dispatcher then sends a police officer who is also traumatized by that one event. But the dispatcher themselves is getting these calls every minute for their entire mm -hmm. shift. And sometimes they have to do double shifts because people don't show up to work. So let's imagine someone who for sixteen hours is dealing with every individual person's trauma. Um, so that takes fact, a So in fact, exposed to more than maybe the police officer, because the police exactly. officer may have to deal with the people in the flesh, but is not dealing sort of with every minute or two or three exactly. with another terrible episode of some sort. Yeah. Exactly. And if you think yeah. of the way uh, we've kind yeah. of set up our structures, police officers, first responders are doing you know, really significant work and are getting some support. But the call taker is considered a clerical worker. And therefore, they're not getting the level of mental health services mm -hmm. that they should get, uh, the breaks that they need. Um, and so they face really high levels of sick leave, uh, really high levels of burnout, uh, are more likely to quit. And these things affect kind of our ability to deliver good services. Um, same thing with social workers. Social mm -hmm. workers face really high levels of turnover, especially in their first couple of years of service, uh, partly because it's just a really hard job, Absolutely. and you're facing with really, you know, you're facing really difficult decisions uh, that are often life and death for children. So, how do you deal with this? What, what are you learning about how to uh, avoid burnout, or if there is burnout, what to do then? 
So we're still thinking about that. There are some um, kind of longer term solutions that people have worked on. All, um, you know, all the, the general solutions are around support mm -hmm. uh, for mental health uh, outcomes. But uh, there are challenges along the way that are, again, implementation challenges. Uh, oftentimes, the people who need the support don't know that they need it. So how do you increase take up mm -hmm. of uh, support services that already exist? How do you think about um, giving a, a, a peer group to an individual employee that they can talk to about these things? Mm -hmm. So one thing that uh, I'm studying now is uh, how do you support uh, a 911 dispatcher by making them feel like they're part of a community of other 911 dispatchers? You know, firefighters or police officers have a very strong professional identity. Physicians have a very strong right. professional identity. If we create the same type of strong professional identity for 911 dispatchers, will they be able to support each other um, in, in a different way? So that's something that we're looking at now. Uh, there are many things that could work, but uh, you know, I, I want to emphasize that if we don't test them in a very rigorous way, uh, we're not going to be able to find solutions that can be scaled up across the country. So you've talked about recruiting better people, about trying to motivate people, but also government has to motivate citizens sometimes to do things. So sure. I know you're working on blight right now. So what sure. does that involve? So, so blight uh, is a problem that across local governments um, is just really difficult to, uh, to implement. So essentially, anytime you have a blight, Challenge. So tell me what blight is, though, first of all. Just sure. So I know, okay, I'm sure. So, so blight is essentially the phenomenon that um, there are houses or buildings that need repair, sometimes uh, a lot of repair, mm -hmm. and the government is having trouble getting the owners, the property owners themselves, to fix those properties. Now, the main tools that uh, a government has are fines, essentially, inspections and fines. Um, and often they're not enough. So well, let's let's back up though. So blight is a, is a bad thing, and but why exactly? I mean, what ways does it have consequences that go beyond the fact that the building doesn't look nice? Sure, but that's an aesthetic concern. Is, are there deeper concerns that we should have about blight? Sure, there's some evidence that um, blighted neighborhoods face all sorts of problems because they are blighted. So, for example, higher rates of crime, lower property values. So higher rate of crime. So this is to some extent what's called the broken windows theory. Sure. And that if you're uh, a thief or something, you may go to a neighborhood which looks like it's not in great repair because you think people aren't monitoring the place so well and therefore there's more likely you'd be a successful criminal in that neighborhood? That's, that's one theory. Now there's a lot of debate about right. whether or not the broken windows hypothesis is true, but okay. certainly there are other problems in blighted neighborhoods for the communities that live there. For example, public health concerns that uh, are often understudied in blighted neighborhoods. I mean the main problem is that as the neighborhood becomes more and more blighted, all the things that we associate with um, high poverty and high crime rates happen in those neighborhoods at the same time. So it's mm -hmm. really hard to disentangle what's causing what. Um, but it's certainly something that a lot of city governments are, are struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that they spend a lot of resources trying to fix. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where um, a better relationship with uh, citizens or with residents helps. And governments are trying to motivate residents to, to fix up these properties themselves. So how do you do that? Well, usually cities send out an inspector mm -hmm. uh, when, when a call comes in to say that there's a problem with a property. And then uh, there are kind of a series of letters that go to an individual property owner that say, you know, please fix up your property. If you don't fix up your property, we're going to fine you. Um, please fix up your property. You haven't paid your fine. We're going to take you to court. It's this lengthy process of back and mm -hmm. forth where both the property owner and the government would benefit if that just happened sooner. Mm -hmm. um, in order to, to do that, uh, we've been working with a lot of cities across the country, thinking about how behavioral science, again, can be used to encourage people mm -hmm. to take action sooner. It turns out, um, just simplifying the process of interacting with government, telling people in clear language what the problem is, what the resources are to support them, and how they can go about fixing their property um, at an early stage, saves money both for the government, but also um, helps uh, property owners fix up their so properties. So for some, sometimes it's so complicated. I get a letter in the mail and it's just so complicated I can't figure out what the problem is. And yes. so you want to make it very simple. Yes. You know, fix your door. Exactly. Fix your property. Yeah. Mow your lawn. Yeah. Um, it turns out there's a lot of government communication that was written uh, in legalese. <laughs> yeah, in legalese. Um, and that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, if you add to that 
the fact that this is coming at a time where you might have a whole bunch of other letters right. uh, that you need to deal with, uh, uh, bills that you need to deal with, it's easy to see how for, for a certain property owner this is not going to be the priority. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we've done is we've tested new ways of communicating with people early. Um, in New Orleans, for example, we sent people a, a courtesy letter before the first inspection saying, hey, just so you know, someone has called to complain about your property. We're going to send out an inspector to check. Um, it's not a legally binding document, mm -hmm. but even just this courtesy letter in simple language um, increased the number of people who fixed up their property by that first wow. inspection. Wow. Um, so all these kind of small tweaks to how we do government or how we interact with residents can really add up. Um, and that's the, the kind of premise of, of behavioral science when it comes to public administration. So that's very exciting and, and it's a way to make government work better. There's also just in management some very large issues about how do you think strategically and do things like that. And I know you're teaching the management course here. You taught it this last year with Michael Dock, who was Assistant Secretary for Strategic Global Affairs in the Obama administration. And he has a much different way of teaching management, which is the more traditional way that involves case studies and discussing incidents in which he's been involved. What do you think the corresponding value is of each method? Obviously, you're committed to the scientific approach, but does that other approach have stuff to add as well? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think those of us who have worked in government um, feel like you can't really understand how difficult public management is unless you've lived it. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to get things done mm -hmm. in government. Mm -hmm. And so when, when um, the case study method is used, especially when it's used well, like Professor Nacht uh, does, the, um, it really helps students understand kind of what what a decision looks like in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the facts of the case, you don't know how things are gonna end up, um, and you have to struggle with various options. Sure. Um, the, the best cases that I've seen help students understand the trade-offs and understand that you know, at any point in government you're making a decision without all the facts, mm -hmm. and that's tough. Um, sticking to a decision that you've made without having all the data, without having time to research the correct uh, solution is what good public managers do. Now, my sense is that if you combine that approach um, or the case, case method with data and evidence, you can start building a toolkit uh, to help public managers face different types of challenges. So not all, you know, not all public managers are facing crises on a daily basis. Um, using the data and evidence on kind of your day-to-day -day work helps inform how you handle a crisis, uh, but it also allows you to, to think through potential solutions or potential trade-offs in, in a new way. So part of the trick with teaching students is that to teach them methods like the experiments and so forth to learn more about how to make things better, but also you have to deal with the fact that they're going to have situations where they don't have time to go do an experiment. They're going to have to make decisions and to give them the tools so that they can actually do that in real time. Sure, um, that is a challenge. I would say that um, the best public managers set themselves up for success uh, by collecting data in advance. So you'll see across the country, especially at the local mm -hmm. level, um, uh, city governments have a data officer or an innovation team, and their goal is really to make the use of data and evidence a part of those daily decisions. Uh, a lot of cities have set mm -hmm. up STAT programs. These are programs that uh, essentially use data and statistics to inform decisions on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis. Um, so there are ways to kind of use data more regularly. So are you seeing that data is changing the way government operates in fundamental ways? Uh, there's a lot of talk about big data and yeah. And the use of data, is, is that happening? I think it's happening. And it's happening uh, in places that you may not expect it to be happening. It's not just in the big cities across the country mm -hmm. and the federal government. Even mid-sized cities across, across the country are using data and evidence uh, to make decisions. And those could be anything from where do we send um, a fire inspector, uh, which is a big data question, all the way to you know, how do we evaluate a new campaign to get people to use our library services. Uh, all those things have a data component to them, and, and it's happening, and it's happening quite rapidly, I would say. So you get out and you interact a lot with people in cities and so forth. Can you give us just one anecdote to give us some sense of the sort of uh, hope, actually, that you have, I think, that we're getting better at doing these things? Do you have some particular person that you've encountered in some particular situation where you said, wow, they really are doing great stuff? Uh, well, I have lots of examples, I should say. Um, I've done a lot of work with uh, the What Works Cities initiative, which mm -hmm. is a, a Bloomberg Philanthropies initiative to support mid-sized cities. Um, and I've, um, I've seen so much hope or optimism from mid-sized cities. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, uh, in one city that I was working uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona, 
um, the, the team there was first a little hesitant about the use of behavioral science, uh, was thinking through how they could implement a randomized control trial in their city. Um, but by the end of our uh, work together, there was an internal team that said, let's, let's put together a bunch of um, kind of behavioral science enthusiasts from different departments, mm -hmm. and let's meet on a regular basis to think about how we can use behavioral science. The most kind of successful um, for me, success stories in those cases was when uh, someone in a department would say things like, well, how are we going to know if that program is going to work? Why don't we test it? Or why don't we you know, use two versions of this message when we try to communicate with residents mm -hmm. and see which one is most effective? Just that change in mindset, uh, I think is really going to make a difference uh, in, in a lot of cities. And you know, for me, the, the success stories are, are also when, when something fails and uh, a civil servant in a local government says, well, we tested it, it doesn't work, uh, let's try something else. That takes a lot of courage, I think, yes. uh, in government. Yes. And, and it's happening, so that's, that's good news. So you're seeing real possibilities for the future with respect to data and testing things. And just to end, tell us a little bit about our students and what you see in them that it makes it uh, exciting to come here to the Goldman School. Yeah, uh, well, you know, as you know, it's my, it's my first year teaching. Right. Uh, Goldman students, and when I first uh, presented the the idea of using data and evidence in in class, uh, I was just struck by the thoughtfulness of the students. To be mm -hmm. perfectly honest, you expect when you're a new professor that you're going to get questions about, you know, how do I get an A, or is this going to be on the syllabus? All the questions that I was getting were, you know, how are you thinking about social justice, or where does kind of racial um, racial divides come into play when you're thinking about big data? How should we think about this for our most vulnerable community members? And those are exactly the kinds of questions um, that I grapple with in my research, but that make you know, professors excited to come to work. Like Those are exactly the kinds of things we want to be talking about. We don't want to be talking about how to get an A or an A minus. Um, and, I, and I feel like the Goldman students are excited to be here. They all have a very strong sense of purpose, and they're all um, looking for new tools so that they can go do interesting things afterwards, both in government and outside of government. But it's very palpable that they're um, here because they want to be here and because they want to learn how to make things better for people. So Professor Elizabeth Linos, thank you for telling us how management is getting to be more scientific, more based on data, and hopefully more successful as a result of that, and how I think the future looks bright in the public service, that things can get better and will get better. Thank I you. Hope so.